So you guys probably saw, but yesterday Amnesty International came out with an article accusing the Ukrainian military forces of uh, uh, endangering civilians with reckless uh, military tactics. Now, I've seen a lot of pushback on this article, and a lot of it seems to be very reflexive, you know? Like accusing Amnesty International of being a Russia shill or whatever. A lot of people are saying Amnesty International is like siding with Russia, but I don't think that's an acceptable argument, like, at all. Um, even if Ukraine is in the right to defend itself, uh, I don't think that means that it can't be criticized if there are, in fact, um, military tactics that it's using that are uh, destructive to, to civilians, you know. Even defenders have to be careful about that. Even if you're in the right with a war, you can be irresponsible. So I want to look into the article really quick just to get my, you know, impression of it. Um, yeah. Because this, this article could be completely true, and I would still support Ukraine defending itself. I just want them to do it in the best way possible. Um, we're gonna look as best as we can. I can't really double-check their info here, because, uh, you know, I am not Amnesty International. <laughs> so, I, uh, you know, I can't, I can't quite, like, empirically debunk anything they say, but I, I want to see, you know. Um... Military bases set up in residential areas, including schools and hospitals. Attacks launched from populated civilian areas. Such violations in no way justify Russia's indiscriminate attacks, which have killed and injured countless civilians. Ukrainian forces have put civilians in harm's way by establishing bases and operating weapon systems in populated residential areas, including in schools and hospitals, as they repelled the Russian invasion that began in February. Amnesty International said today, such tactics violate international humanitarian law and endanger civilians as they turn civilian objects into military targets. The ensuing Russian strikes in populated areas have killed civilians and destroyed civilian infrastructure. Um, we've documented a pattern of Ukrainian forces putting civilians at risk and violating the laws of war when they operate in populated areas. Being in a defensive position does not exempt the Ukrainian military from respecting international humanitarian law. Not every Russian attack documented by Amnesty International followed this pattern. However, in certain other locations in which Amnesty International concluded Russia had committed war crimes, including in some areas in the city of Kharkiv, hey, I was there, the organization did not find evidence of Ukrainian forces located in the civilian areas unlawfully targeted by the Russian military. They investigated Russian strikes in Kharkiv, Donbass, and Mykolaiv regions. The organization inspected strikes, interviewed survivors, witnesses, and relatives of victims of attacks, carried out remote sensing and weapon, uh, weapons analysis. Let's see. Researchers found evidence of Ukrainian forces launching strikes from within populated residential areas, as well as basing themselves in civilian buildings in 19 towns and villages in the regions. So, question. When they say basing themselves in civilian buildings, do they mean occupied civilian buildings? Like, where the civilians haven't been evacuated? I, I assume they have to mean that, right? Because I don't think there's anything wrong with setting up defensive positions in hospitals and schools if the hospitals and schools have been vacated and are no longer being used. You know, uh, I assume they mean occupied. It's the same thing people say about Hamas. Yeah, well, Hamas does um, group with civilians while firing at, as, as, at Israel, and that is bad. Um, just a matter of how much they do it. Yeah, many civilians refuse to vacate. Yeah, at that point you should forcibly vacate them. Um, before you start launching like artillery shells or whatever from a, a civilian building, like you should make sure there are no civilians in there because any retaliatory fire that hits you is going to be, you know, you know, hitting civilians as well. Um, most residential areas where soldiers located themselves were kilometers from the front lines. Viable alternatives were, uh, were available that would not endanger civilians, such as military bases or densely wooded areas nearby or other structures further from residential areas. Hmm. In cases it documented, Amnesty International is not aware that the Ukrainian military who located themselves in civilian structures in residential areas asked or assisted civilians to evacuate nearby buildings. If that's true, that's pretty fucked. Not even asking local civilians to evacuate before setting up defensive positions in residential areas, that is pretty bad. Um, if that is the case. You know, again, I can't really second guess Amnesty International here. I don't really have, like, a counter, you know, like, contrary data, but, you know. Let's see. Survivors and witnesses 
claimed Ukrainian military had been operating near their homes at the times of the strike, exposing the areas to retaliatory fire from Russian forces. International humanitarian law requires all parties to a conflict to avoid locating, to the maximum extent feasible, military objectives within or near densely populated areas. But aren't they conscripting civvies right now? Yeah, but that's not a war crime. Um, because they're, they're no longer civvies when they're conscripted, right? Um, the mother of a 50-year-old man killed in a rocket attack on the 10th of June in a village south of Mykolaiv told Amnesty International, The military were staying in a house next to our home, and my son often took food to the soldiers. I begged him several times to stay away from there because I was afraid for his safety. That afternoon when the strike happened, my son was in the courtyard and I was in the house. He was killed on the spot. His body was ripped to shreds. Our home was partially destroyed. Amnesty International researchers found military equipment and uniforms in the house next door. Repeatedly struck by Russian attacks, which killed at least one older man. I don't understand why our military is firing from the cities and not from the field. Another resident, a 50-year-old man, said, what, what is with all the 50-year-olds? Okay. There is definitely military activity in the neighborhood. When there is ongoing, outgoing fire, we hear incoming fire afterwards. Amnesty International researchers witnessed soldiers using a residential building some 20 meters from the entrance of the underground shelter used by the residents where the older man was killed. In one town in Donbass on the 6th of May, Russian forces used widely banned and inherently indiscriminate cluster munitions over a neighborhood of mostly single- or two-story homes where Ukrainian forces were operating artillery. Shrapnel damaged the walls of the house where Anna, 70, lives with her son and her 95-year-old mother. So it looks like this is a collection of anecdotes of civilians being injured or killed due to their proximity to Ukrainian defensive positions. Military bases and hospitals. Amnesty International researchers witnessed Ukrainian forces using hospitals as de facto military bases in five locations. Um... In two towns, dozens of soldiers were resting, milling about, and eating meals in hospitals. In other town, soldiers were firing from near the hospital. Well, wait. Is it, is it a violation of international humanitarian law for soldiers to, like, rest at hospitals? I thought that's kind of what hospitals were for. Now, if they're firing from the hospital, then obviously they're, 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 they're putting people there in danger. But if they're just there... Um, I mean, I guess. A Russian airstrike on the 28th of April injured two employees at a medical laboratory in a suburb of Kharkiv after Ukrainian forces set up a base in a compound. Military bases and schools. Schools have been temporarily closed to students since the conflict began, but in most cases the buildings were located close to populated civilian neighborhoods. At 22 out of 29 schools visited, Amnesty International researchers either found schools Soldiers using the premises are found evidence of current or prior military activity, including the presence of military fatigues, discarded munitions, army, ration packets, and military vehicles. I don't know if I'm fully buying this. So, I don't think they're lying. I, I'm curious about the presentation of this information, though. Um... I, I'm I'm kind of curious about it. So the so here's the issue, right? So here here's the problem. Um, when you're fighting a defensive war, like okay, most fighting these days in in war is going to be done in urban areas. The reason for this is because cities are um, natural defensive fortifications. Every apartment block, every building, every it, everything like every part of a city is like maximized to give you opportunities to defend an area um you know fighting in an open field i mean you you can shoot a bullet or fire a rocket and it'll just go miles before hitting anything but in cities you know they're 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 very 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 defensible so as a product of that if you're fighting a defensive war you if you want to win and i think the ukrainian people do you have to occupy buildings, not just military bases, because military bases aren't necessarily defensible positions. A lot of military bases are literally just barracks and depots containing like uh, vehicles and stuff, you know? Um, that doesn't mean that they're like fortresses that can be defended or whatever. When you're retreating, when the line, here, let me pull up the map, live UA map. 
So we can take a look right here and like get a feel for it. But when when the line of conflict involves like tens of thousands of people dying, there is a reason why so much conflict is happening around cities here. Here's Kharkiv. The Great Territory is, area, is an area that Russia used to occupy and no longer does. Tens of thousands of people have died here. The, the little oval that I'm drawing with my mouse represents an area where there are probably at this point thousands of, thousands of corpses sinking into the dirt. Um, a lot of fighting is going to happen, like, at cities. That's why they wanted to make a rush for Kiev. At this point, Kiev is basically unconquerable from the Russian military, because now that it's had time to prepare and fortify, the process of taking a capital city like Kiev would be like a monstrous effort. Um, you know, the only way to easily take cities like this, especially God, cities on the river, the only easy way to take cities like this is you either get them before they have time to prepare, or you're willing to level them to dust. Uh, nuclear weapons, indiscriminate carpet bombing, fire bombing, you know, apart from that, any attempt to take a city is going to be like a monstrously difficult endeavor because they're very defensible. So if you want to win when you're fighting a defensive war, you need to occupy buildings. And most buildings are going to be civilian buildings. That's like 99.9% .9 of buildings. I think that whether you're defending or attacking, you have a responsibility to minimize civilian casualties. Obviously, Russia does not give a shit about this. Um, but if you're, uh, if you're Ukrainian, you know, if you're in the Ukrainian armed forces, you always want to make sure that the areas of conflict, the areas where you're currently fighting, are away from civilians. You don't want to fire artillery or anything, really, or house soldiers near civilians, because those areas are going to be targeted by Russian forces. Uh, you have to be careful about that. The, the issue here is that a lot of this language is very ambiguous about the actual harm that's being done. They have a few anecdotes here of civilian casualties due to people's proximity to the soldiers, but we're lacking info on a lot of specifics that kind of bother me. If they wanted to make this case, I feel like they could be talking about, like, operational doctrines. They could be talking about, like, broader strategies. But when they're saying stuff like, we looked at a school and we found military fatigues in there, like, so? Yeah, you're hearing background noise because the Blue Angels are in town. One sec. Anyway, do you understand what I'm talking about? The what? D Google it. Um, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, you could pull anecdotes like this from basically any defensive conflict. They're not really talking about operational doctrines, and they're not being that specific about the actual level of irresponsibility. Has there been irresponsibility? Have the Ukrainian armed forces done the best they can to minimize civilian casualties? Probably not. I'm sure there's more they could do, and I want them to be held to that standard. The issue here is that I, I feel like they're painting a picture of massive incompetence and disregard while only providing evidence for, like, either relatively minor issues in a broader conflict, because, again, we're talking about a colossal war here. I mean, it is it is tragic when civilians die, but... I think that making generalized statements about the behavior of the Ukrainian military in a conflict that's claimed so many lives already is maybe a bit irresponsible. Um, and the, the extent to which this is being like, you know, I, I guess I don't really know. Like, are we talking about schools and areas that have been completely abandoned? Are we talking about like how like in how many of these situations did the soldiers really have um, an alternative like solution? And also. Here's another quick question, by the way. If you are in the Ukrainian armed forces and you're trying to keep um, Mikolev from being taken, where do you defend? So do you set up your forces out here in the open plains so that you die? <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you establish defensive positions out here where you will instantly get annihilated from 100 miles away by artillery? Or do you set up defensive positions in the actual urban center of the city where you're capable of defending it, right? And if you are setting up positions here, you know, to what extent can you avoid setting up in residential neighborhoods? Earlier in the article, they said that the Ukrainian forces had an opportunity to occupy other areas here, such as military bases or densely wooded areas. Is that really applicable in all cases? Like, 
densely it's it's an industrialized country it's not like densely wooded areas are the only like russia could go around them <laughs> And as for military bases, military bases aren't necessarily defensible positions. Vosh is armchair generaling. No, no, no. I know what I'm saying right now is correct. I know what I'm saying right now is correct. You, first of all, how do you bring military vehicles into a dense forest? Like, I want answers to these questions from Amnesty International. If you're Ukraine and you're trying to bring your military equipment, including tanks, how do you hide that in a forest? Tanks can't move through forests. Certainly not densely wooded forests. I mean, maybe there are some forests that can move through, but that's not a reliable process. Um, and as for military bases, first of all, if you tell the Russians, hey, what, you know where the Ukrainian military is? They're all in their base. They'll just bomb the base. Like, why would they do? Like, that's 101 shit. The whole point here is that if the Ukrainian armed forces are in an obvious open area, that Russia will just annihilate them from afar. So, like, you guys know what military bases look like, right? Military bases are not... Like, here's, here's a military base. This is a military base the, um, that we held in Iraq. Hey, hey, Russia. We have uh, 4,000 troops and all of our equipment at this military base. Please do not fire rockets at it. <laughs> like, right? I mean, you, you, they, they, military bases just tend to be open depots with barracks and fences around them to keep civilians from wandering in to spray paint the place. They're not, they're not like, they're not like fortified, <laughs> you know? Um... It's they're not necessarily like a a location. I mean, we can take a look at um, U.S. military bases all over the world as just an example, but um, they just tend to be like open areas. And also, even if these were defensible, broadcasting ahead of time that this is where you're setting up your defensive positions, and only being able to set up defensive positions in places like this would suggest that the Russian military could either nuke you from afar, not literally nuke you, but like, you know, blow you up from afar, or they could just avoid you, right? Does anyone tr get what I'm saying here? I guess it's not that I don't think the Ukrainian military should be held to a high standard when it comes to civilian protections. It's just, at a cursory glance, this article seems to be suggesting operational negligence when it's only providing evidence for individual tragedies alongside some stuff that may or may not have been literally necessary in the war effort. I mean, if Russia is moving into a city and you want to defend that city, it kind of makes sense you'd set up in a school? Like, if the area is evacuated or not, like you try to evacuate the area, if you can't set up in a place where no civilians are remaining, but civilians aren't like leaving fast enough, do you just leave the city and just let Russia take it? It's really difficult to manage a defensive war. I tend to lean like charitability on the side of the defender when it comes to any kind of like civilian casualty or safety oriented stuff because it's much harder to manage that when you're on the defense than the offense. The offending group can just choose to not fire rockets at civilian populations, you know. The defending group has to, like, be really careful about balancing the effectiveness of their defense with proximity to civilian clusters that may or may not be occupied. Um, yeah, especially in an artillery war. Yeah. Okay, uh, sorry, I don't want to ramble about this. Does everyone get kind of where I'm coming from? This isn't me saying that the, um, the Amnesty International article is, like, wrong or lying, because I don't think that. I guess I just don't I, I, yeah, I guess I don't, I don't fully know, like what, how earned the degree of 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 severity is here. But let me finish reading. What about things like Hamas? Well, Hamas does regularly and deliberately endanger civilians by setting up bases in civilian areas. So I don't think that's I don't think that's comparable. Um, okay. In a town east of Odessa, Amnesty International witnessed a broad pattern of Ukrainian soldiers using civilian areas for lodging and staging areas, including basing armored vehicles under trees in purely residential neighborhoods, and using two schools located in densely populated residential areas. Okay, 
densely populated as in urban development or as in there were still civilians there? I wish they'd be more clear about this. The most damning thing that they could say about the behavior of the Ukrainian armed forces is that they did not really make an effort to evacuate civilians. To my understanding, they generally have, um, but it's pretty difficult to like systemically evacuate half of a country while you're being invaded. That's a logistical nightmare, right? The Amnesty International staff in Ukraine were not consulted on this report. Wait, is, this, is that true? Wait, they posted their own rebuttal. Wait, 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 Ukrainian Amnesty International wasn't consulted? Can you give me the rebuttal? Can you link it to me? What an insane thing to do. Okay, okay, I have, I have the appeal from the Amnesty International team in Ukraine. Gotcha, thank you. I'll read that after I'm done with this. Let's, let's finish this. I, I want to talk about the Alex Jones thing. This is just... If, if they really posted this with no heads up from, from AI, yeah, AIUA, that's, um, that's really fucked. This, this, then my attitude on this goes from like irresponsible to like actual like propagandizing for Russia. Russian strikes near the schools killed and injured several civilians between April and late June, including a child and older woman killed in a rocket attack in their home on the 28th of June. In Bakhmut, Ukrainian forces were using a university building as a base when a Russian strike hit, reportedly killing seven soldiers. The university is adjacent to a high-rise residential building which was damaged in the strike, alongside other civilian homes roughly 50 meters away. Amnesty International found the remains of a military vehicle. See, like, what does this mean? So, Ukrainian forces in a city that was being attacked were in a large defensible building and then there was a rocket strike on that building, and then it damaged a high-rise residential building, but apparently didn't even kill any civilians, because otherwise I assume they would have mentioned it. And they found remains of a military vehicle in the courtyard of the Bomb University building. They realized, like, what do you think happens in cities that are being invaded? Yeah, well, yeah. Are they like? Are they like temple? It's it's a total war. They're fighting for every inch of territory. Uh, uh, can they not even look there? Does if Russia entered a city, and that city wasn't fully evacuated, it seems like by the logic of this article, the article, the Ukrainian armed forces literally could not set up defensive positions anywhere unless full evacuation has taken place. Any position they set up would be somewhere near civilians. And that, therefore, they wouldn't be able to... So they would just have to leave. Wouldn't this apply to all of World War II? When we reconquered France or moved into Germany, wars entail fighting near civilian areas. I think you should make a good faith effort to, 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 to evacuate the civilians, but you can't, like, not... You're kind of strawman the article. I, I don't think I am. I, I feel like some of these criticisms are, are just criticizing the nature of surviving the war with no alternatives presented. Um, hold on. Anyway, anyway. International humanitarian law does not specifically ban parties to a conflict from basing themselves in schools that are not in session. However, militaries haven't... So, okay, so there's not even a humanitarian law against that. However, militaries have an obligation to avoid using schools that are near houses or apartment buildings full of civilians, putting those lives at risk unless there's a compelling military need. Wait, unless there is a compelling military need. They're being invaded. The, the schools they're setting up in are have Russia bearing down on them. I don't think they're doing it for, for fun. Okay, guys, hold on, hold on. You're giving me a lot of links. Let me finish this, okay? Armed conflicts seriously hamper children's right to education, and military use of schools can result in destruction that further deprives children of this right once the war ends. You know what else would deprive their rights? If Russia won the war. This is... I, I, can't, I can't believe this. Like, we're... These people... Like, the, 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 the armed forces of Ukraine are, like, dying out there, trying to defend every inch of land they can. Like... If they have to if they have to set up shop in a school while they're trying to keep Russia from occupying a city, like 
This is this isn't like a flippant and malicious use of civilian populations in order to prompt. First of all, Russia doesn't give a shit about killing civilians. So deliberately putting yourself near civilian populations is not going to keep them from attacking. They were bombing Kiev from like day one. Um, they were firing missiles into the capital just indiscriminately, that one of the first hits on Kiev was a fucking apartment block. Um, it, it, like, it, it, schools are a fairly defensible position. They have large buildings. They tend to be pretty, like, large and well-built because they're meant to last a while. They're often made of brick. Like, it, uh, like I don't know. I mean, they're fighting for their lives over there. Um, Ukraine is one of 114 countries that have endorsed the Safe Schools Declaration, an agreement to protect education amid armed conflict, which allows parties to make use of abandoned or evacuated schools only when there's no viable alternative. So where's the viable alternative? What? Yeah, so, so they didn't do anything wrong. This is a defensive war. It, it, yeah. It's, this isn't like a little civil conflict. They're not putting down protesters here. They're, they're literally fighting for every... Look at all this. They're dying every day. This is so, I don't know, disrespectful? Every one of these red dots represents like a recent shelling. Like, there are tanks rolling through the countryside. They're being shelled from ships in, in, the, in the, 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 the Black Sea. They're, they're, they're fighting for every building they can keep. Again, like, I think they should be held to scrutiny, but, like, th some of these are s criticisms are so vague, but so generalized, that I, it f this feels like a hit piece. And then at the end here, they do indicate indiscriminate attacks by Russian forces. Um, but then they go back to criticizing the Ukraine military. The Ukraine military's practice of locating military objectives within populated areas does not in any way justify indiscriminate Russian attacks. What does this mean? The Ukrainian military's practice of locating military objectives within populated areas. What? Their country is a populated area. You can't build a fort in the middle of a forest or a, or a, or a field. The, by populated area, what they mean is like, urban development like what you that's where wars happen they happen over cities that's that's why these giant conflict zones of russians being pushed back have happened in cities mikolaev um up here we have um Kriviri. i know i'm mispronouncing that um we they fought over um where's um they fought over uh, uh over over odessa where's how am I missing it? The Kirsten. Am I just blind? Or is it further in? Mariupol? They fought over Mariupol for, for months. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Here. Yeah. They're still fighting over it. The fight, like... Oh, hey, yeah. Does that mean Amnesty wants all civilians out of the East? Um, I mean, ideally, you would fully evacuate the half of the country, but there are limits to the viability of that. Um, I, I mean, they've tried. I know that there have been orders from Ukraine to, like, get civilians the fuck out of here. They've literally set up, like, humanitarian pathways to try to get people out of... I know Mariupol was a big one, where they were trying to get as many people out of there as possible. Um... All parties to a conflict must at all times distinguish between military objectives and civilian objects and take all feasible cautions, including in choice of weapons to minimize civilian harm. Indiscriminate attacks which kill or injure civilians or damage civilian objects are war crimes. The Ukrainian government should immediately ensure it locates its forces away from populated areas or should evacuate civilians from areas the military is operating. The only thing that I care about here is the accusation that Ukraine is not doing a good enough job evacuating. Outside of that, a lot of these criticisms seem like bullshit. Military should never use hospitals to engage in warfare and should only use schools or civilian homes as a last resort. I mean, yeah, that's what they're doing when there are no viable alternatives. Um, Amnesty International contract, uh, contacted the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense with the findings of their research on the 29th of July. At time of publication, they had not yet responded. 
Okay, and now we have a, all the shit you guys linked. So then they did not consult the U Ukraine's Amnesty International team, who then put out this. Today, the English language website of Amnesty International published a material criticizing the actions of the armed forces of Ukraine. It was created on the basis of data compiled by foreign researchers of the crisis response de uh, department of the global office of our organization. The Ukraine office was not involved in the preparation or writing of the text of that publication, and unfortunately, already at the initial stage of developing this report, we reached a dead end, where the arguments of our team regarding the inadmissibility and incompleteness of such material were not taken into account. For their part, representatives of the Ukrainian office did everything they could to prevent this material from being made public. When our repeated objections were answered with a firm no, we also did everything we could to minimize the distribution of material. They're being pretty forthcoming here. We asked the authors to send us all versions of the material in advance. Unfortunately, this did not happen. We convinced them to ask for an official comment from the Ministry of Defense, but at the same time, unfortunately, they did not give us enough time to receive an answer and publish this research without the comment. We also categorically refused to publish this press release on our website or translate it into Ukrainian due to its, in our opinion, one-sidedness. We're very sorry that even after all possible arguments against, we were still not heard. Every person from the Ukrainian Office of Amnesty knows that Russia is responsible for crimes of aggression against Ukraine. Moreover, a significant part of our team are people who are personally forced to save themselves and their loved ones from war with Russia, leaving everything behind. Some of us have already become displaced persons or refugees twice. Since the 24th of February, my Ukrainian colleagues and I have been working nonstop to ensure that all war crimes are verified and recorded for the international community. We have released more than two dozen materials about crimes committed by the Russian Federation. Um... Nevertheless, we've had a phenomenon in the past, but it would cost us, and it seems like... Okay, so they're not listing here the arguments against. What are these other links? Board member of Amnesty International Finland has made a threat accusing Amnesty International of underreporting human rights abuses by Ukrainian armed forces. Recommends Grey Zone as a source for this. Okay, well, this is Amnesty International Finland, so I don't know if that necessarily means they have any... Wait, Finland? Wait, hold on. If if you're pro-Russian in Finland, don't they just lynch you? Finland. Oh, he's like... Is, is this like the one pro-Russian guy in Finland? Yeah, I guess this these were like the pre-lynching tweets. Jesus Christ. Um... Director of Amnesty uh, International Ukraine has quit in a clash with Amnesty headquarters. Um, Pokoshuk? Oksana Pokoshuk. Sure. Accuses the campaign group of publishing inadmissible and incomplete evidence and shutting out her colleagues from an investigation. Um, Richard Hannay, the based and red pilled Greek uh, military history. Um, a uh, uh, student who we had on recently agrees with what I said. It is odd. Obviously, Ukrainians need to use urban areas to defend themselves. It's not always um, feasible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that means I'm right because he's cool. Yeah, this is also the Finland, um, Finland Amnesty International person. I don't think this Finland Amnesty International person had any weight on the report published by Am Amnesty General. However, if you're a, fr a fan of Grey Zone, you can't be an Amnesty International. You are literally pro-war. Yeah, Glenn Greenwald retweets, yeah. This is pretty bad, dude. That article was pretty bad. Man, I wonder if I'm ever going to get somebody defending this article. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, again, Amnesty International has access to information that I don't have, but there are logical problems with this article. There are, there are pro like, logically, like, the fact that in a, in a time period where in total war, all defensive positions are basically set up in cities, the idea of, like, well, just set up your military fortifications in <laughs> military bases, which everyone knows the location of, or in deep forests where you can't move equipment. Like, okay. Are, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Did you see the Russian embassy tweeted the report out, but removed all the parts saying Russia should still be blamed for war crimes? Oh, no! There's the Russian embassy 
two points underneath the article. Where's that? What's that conspicuous white space down here? Where did? Oh no! Just got to trim out a little bit, dude. They're such clowns. S absolutely shameless. Absolutely shameless. Why would they not crop it so it doesn't look like they whited something out here? No news article would have this much empty space after the subheader. Why would you not just crop it out, like, a little further above? Because they don't need to? Yeah, it doesn't really matter, right? Because, like, they're obviously dishonest and everyone knows. Um, okay, yeah, well, I guess now we have an opinion on this article. I really dislike it. I, yeah, it's really bad. It's really, really bad. I would, I would, I would argue that this, um, this is, this is essentially a pro-Russian article because not only is it misrepresentative and borderline delusional in its prescriptions, but the things that it's prescribing would cause Ukraine to lose the war. If Ukraine was like, yes, we will only establish defensive positions in dense forests and military bases, um, leaving aside the fact that a lot of military bases are in populated areas, you know, like, yeah, it would, yeah, no, it's ridiculous. Um, it's one of those cowardly takes where it's like, we'll, we're, we're going to condemn Russia for invading, but we're also going to condemn, you know, Ukraine for defending. Why, why not make an article on the shit Russia's doing? Like, there's so much stuff to work with there. Okay. I'm sure they have one somewhere. Just like, do another one.